Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of newspaper analysis. Today we are going to discuss the Hindu newspaper dated 27th of November 2019, Delhi edition. The articles which we are going to cover are displayed on this screen. Let's now begin with the discussion. So this news has been published on page number 8. When 8000 migratory birds flock to Andhra Pradesh. This article talks about the arrival of around 6,000 grey pelicans and 1,200 painted stalks at Koleru Lake. Now, if we analyze the syllabus of preliminary examination, we will see that general issues on environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change that do not require subject specialization is one of the lines given. And in the past, five to six years UPSC has asked questions related to lakes and the flora and fauna of those lakes in almost every preliminary examination. This question was asked in 2019 prelims examination. Consider the following statements. Under the Ramsar Convention, it is mandatory on the part of the Government of India to protect and conserve all wetlands in territory of India. The wetland rules 2010 were framed by the Government of India based on the recommendation of Ramsar Convention. And third option, the wetland rules 2010 also encompass the drainage area or catchment regions of the wetlands as determined by authority. As we know that Koleru Lake is one of the Ramsar sites in India and hence Ramsar Convention becomes extremely important. Also in 2018, the question was asked which one of the following is an artificial lake? Kodai Canal, Koleru, Nainital or Renuka? And you can see that Koleru was directly asked. So apart from the water bodies which have been in news, Ramsar sites become extremely important even if they are not current. So we will discuss Koleru Lake and its various characteristics. And then we will also see that how to prepare all the Ramsar sites which are extremely important from prelims point of view. On the screen you can see two screenshots of Google map which show the location of Koleru Lake. So the first map gives the overall perspective and location of Koleru map on the map of India and you can see that it is located in Andhra Pradesh. And the second image is zoomed in map of the same region. Area marked with the red is an approximate location of Koleru Lake. You can see that Koleru Lake lies near to the delta region of Krishna in Godavari, but it is not a coastal lake. In fact, it is far off from the coast, you can see. So it is not a coastal water body like Vimbanad or Chilka Lake. Now if you see on the image, lines marked in blue are Godavari and Krishna River. And you can see that this particular lake lies in the drainage basin of these two rivers but it is not connected with them. Now let's understand the characteristics of Koleru Lake. Koleru Lake is a natural eutrophic lake. Now natural means that it was not created by humans. It already existed. So there was this low lying area in which water collected and it became a lake. But it is also a eutrophic lake. What does that mean? Now eutrophication as a process means Excessive richness of nutrients in a lake or a water body frequently due to runoff from the land which causes a dense growth of plant life. As we have said that this is a low lying area so whenever there is a rainfall in the surrounding areas there is a tendency for the water to get collected into this lake and as the water travels towards this low lying region it also collects along with it the fertilizers and various chemicals being used for the cultivation in the surrounding areas which leads to the eutrophication of this lake. We have already said that it lies between two major rivers Krishna and Godavari and keep that in mind that it is not connected with them. Now the sources of water for this lake are seasonal channels. Now let's analyze the significance of this lake. Now first significance of this lake is that it acts as a natural flood reservoir which means that it acts as a balancing reservoir between the deltas of the two rivers. So the excessive water 
of the runoff during rainfall season gets collected in this lake and hence it saves the surrounding areas from flooding. It also acts as a habitat for migratory birds as well as there are a lot of resident birds which permanently reside in this lake. And the particular news which we are discussing today deals with the same aspect of this lake. And this lake also is very important from livelihood point of view as it acts as a water source for agriculture in the surrounding areas as well as it is used for fisheries. Now there are certain threats related to Koleru Lake. Now during monsoon season there is excessive flooding of this region and this excessive flooding then leads to eutrophication because the excess water collected in the fields ultimately moves in the lake and it leads to the excessive enrichment of the nutrients which becomes a problem for the flora and fauna of the lake. Now as we know that this region receives rainfall for 3 to 4 months of the year and then the streams feeding of this lake dry out during the rest of the period which further leads to drying out of the lake and hence by the time the next monsoon strikes this region the water quantity in this lake has already reduced to a very low quantity. And then the third threat to this lake is a common phenomena across India and which is the encroachment. An encroachment by surrounding villages leads to the reduction in the area and which is a threat for biodiversity. The important bird species which needs to be taken into account are grey pelican and painted stalks. These are the two main bird species spotted in this lake the details of which can be found in the PDF attached with the video. Now as we know that Koleru Lake is one of the Ramsar sites in India and hence it's important for us to know the basics about Ramsar Convention to which India is also a signatory. So the basics about Ramsar Convention has already been discussed in DNS dated 12th of November 2019 by Mangal sir. Now let's learn how to prepare any of the Ramsar sites in India and from where to get the authentic information. As we know that India is a signatory to Ramsar Convention and hence on the page of Ramsar Convention there exists a separate section for India and we reach on the Indian section of Ramsar Convention. If you scroll down you will see a map of India with all the Ramsar sites displayed on it. These are the 5 South Indian sites, 7 East Indian sites and 14 North Indian sites on the Ramsar Convention. Now if you click this, it will automatically show you the sites in Kerala, Tamil Nadu and, and this one is Koleru Lake. Now when you click on this symbol, you will see all the information displayed regarding Koleru Lake and whatever we have discussed, the information has been taken from the Ramsar website. So it's always better to rely on the authentic information of the convention itself and UPSC also keeps in mind the same facts when they design the question. Let's now move on to the next news. This next news has been taken from page number 15. Reserve Bank flags rising bad assets from mudra loans. As we know that one of the flagship schemes of the government of India is mudra which is Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana and this scheme deals with providing loans up to rupees 10 lakh to non-corporate, non-farm, small micro enterprises. Now lately there have been certain criticisms about the effectivity of the Mudra Yojana as well as its implications upon the overall banking structure of the country. Now the Reserve Bank of India has expressed concern over rising bad loans that means non-performing assets from Mudra Yojana. The RBI has stated that while such a massive push would have lifted many beneficiaries out of poverty, there has been some concerns at the growing level of non-performing assets among these borrowers. With stress in such loans increasing, the central bank is set to ask bankers to monitor such loans closely as unsustainable credit growth in the sector could risk the overall system. As far as the syllabus of UPSC is concerned, the provisions of the Mudra scheme is extremely relevant for preliminary point of view. And as far as the performance of the Mudra scheme is concerned, it becomes relevant for both Paper 2 and Paper 3. Under GS Paper 2, 
welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of population by center and states and performance of these schemes now as we know that mudra is a financial initiative taken by the government in order to facilitate the micro units and provide them sufficient funds in order to develop and most of these micro units are run by people belonging to the lower strata of the society the rapid development of indian economy is critically dependent upon the performance of smes and hence indian economy and issues relating to planning mobilization of resources growth development and employment is the part of the syllabus which will include the performance of mudra yojana as we have seen that the rising levels of non performing assets in indian banking system is a cause of great concern and in recent 2 to 3 years mudra yojana is also adding the stress to our banking sector let's now look at the mudra yojana now as we know that small businesses are often unable to avail loans from banks because of lack of collateral and insufficient funds to pay off the interest and hence to enable them to access credit department of financial services under ministry of finance came up with this scheme which is now known as pradhan mantri mudra yojana an important aspect of mudra yojana is that the loans are provided only for non corporate non farm small micro enterprises that means that mudra yojana cannot be availed for farming practices as well as by corporate sector so this means that it will be basically available for manufacturing as well as services belonging to small scale industries now under mudra yojana all banks are required to lend to these sectors for income generating activities below rupees 10 lakh that means it's an obligation of all the banks operating in india to provide loans if a person reaches them for credit now under mudra yojana there are three separate categories under which the loans are provided now first is shishu under which the maximum credit which can be availed is 50000 rupees under kishore the loans which can be availed can be of maximum 5 lakh rupees and under tarun the loans ranging from 5 lakh rupees to 10 lakh rupees are granted now for the implementation of the schemes it's important to create an institutional framework and for this mudra which is micro unit development and refinance agency has been created now it's important to understand what refinancing is as we have discussed that all the banks in india are obligated to provide loans to the beneficiaries under the scheme and these loans are collateral free that means there is no security which is needs to be deposited from the beneficiaries and hence bank should not feel threatened by these loans what this institution which is known as mudra does is that after the loans are provided from the banks the equal amount is credited to their account to make them secure and this is known as refinancing hence mudra provides refinance to all banks seeking refinancing of small business loans given under pradhan mantri mudra yojana as we know that this scheme has been in operation since 2015 and hence now analyze the performance of this scheme now since the inception of this scheme over 19 crore loans have been extended but the problem is that npas under mudra loans have jumped to 5.28% of the disbursement as of march 2019 as against around 4% last year although it is quite lower as compared to overall npas of the banks it is still a cause of concern now that means that if around 100 loans are extended under this scheme five loans have already turned into bad assets overall non performing assets are plaguing our indian banking system add to that the npas created by mudra loans and hence it is a big cause of concern now we should ask a question that why so many bad assets or npas are being created under this scheme now the first problem is of lack of due diligence on behalf of banks 
so the government sets a target each year that it wants that around these many people should get the loans this particular financial year and these targets are distributed to the banks banks since they know that they will be refinanced by the mudra institution for all the loans they are disbursing they do not do their homework before extending the loans now homework includes that if a person approaches them with a business idea they do not analyze the feasibility profitability or the viability of that business project and just extend the loans now this creates a problem in future because the lack of scrutiny leads to the disbursement of loans for the projects which might not be viable and hence it creates a bad loan or npa now the second problem is repayment challenge as we know that the mudra loans are unsecured that is it does not require collateral and in most of the cases the asset which is being purchased through loans itself act as a collateral as we know that in current scenario of economy which is in recession the business of msmes are also quite susceptible to volatility making them more risky either due to the lack of business and profits or due to the willful defaulting tendency of the borrowers because there is no collateral there is a repayment challenge on behalf of the borrowers now as far as banks are concerned they focus more on recovering larger loans rather than small loans for example bank staff may choose to go after one loan with outstanding of rupees 10 lakh rather than pursuing recovery of 10 loans of 1 lakh rupees each and hence these two issues combined have created the problem of repayment challenge so due to the lack of diligence as well as repayment challenges there has been created a massive bad loan under mudra loan scheme as well government needs to modify the scheme as well as it needs to sensitize the banking officials as to rigorously pursue the diligence process before disbursement of loans as well as it needs to make sure that the tendency of the borrowers to not pay the loans because of lack of collateral is curbed otherwise indian economy will continue facing this prolonged challenge of non performing assets which will hinder in the credit growth in the future let's now move on to the next news this next news has been taken from page number 12 transgender persons rights bill passed in rajya sabha now the transgender persons protection of rights bill 2019 now the transgender persons protection of rights bill 2019 was passed by parliament on 26th of november 2019 now there are two informations which can be extracted from this news the first is that this bill was tabled by union social justice and empowerment minister and hence you can learn that the issues regarding transgenders is taken care by ministry of social justice and empowerment and the second important information is regarding transgender persons protection of rights bill 2019 itself as far as the relevance of this topic is concerned under gs2 welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by center and state mechanisms and laws institutions and bodies constituted for protection and betterment of these vulnerable sections and as we know that now after the signature from the president this bill shall become a law or act and hence it becomes important for us to cover this exhaustively first we will analyze the provisions of the bill and then we will look into the issues which have created a debate now the first and the most important aspect of this bill is that it clearly defines transgender person one whose gender does not match the gender assigned at birth will be known as transgender person this definition covers the wide spectrum of gender identifications from trans men and trans women to persons with intersex variations gender queers and persons with socio cultural identities such as kinner or hijra now intersex variation is defined to mean a person who at birth shows variation in his or her primary sexual characteristics external genitalia chromosomes or hormones 
from the normative standards of male or female body this means that while growing up if a person starts showing different traits from the gender assigned at birth that person shall be considered as a transgender as well now as we know that the main concern regarding transgender community is the social stigma and the discrimination associated with them and this bill clearly prohibits such discrimination based on their transgender identity which includes denial of service or unfair treatment in relation to education employment healthcare access to or enjoyment of goods facilities right to movement which means that these people cannot be stopped from moving in the country as far as public places are concerned then right to reside rent or otherwise occupy property which means that these persons cannot be denied a rented property only on the basis of their transgender identity a common problem faced by transgender people is that as soon as their family comes to realization that their child is a transgender then they either abandon the child or force him or her to move out of the house now under this bill every transgender person shall have a right to reside and to be included in his or her household if the immediate family is unable to care for the transgender person the person may be placed in a rehabilitation center on the orders of a contempt court under this law the transgender person devoid of his house will have to approach a court and then court will order a habitation in a rehabilitation center employment ratio of transgender persons is extremely low or negligible in government or private services now under this act no government or private entity can discriminate against a transgender person in employment matters including recruitment and promotion and just like and just like prevention of sexual harassment at workplace under this law also every establishment is required to designate a person to be a complaint officer to deal with the complaints in relation to the act so the remedy or the grievance redressal mechanism has also been created under the bill full education of transgender persons is also a cause of great concern for the society and hence under this bill educational institutions funded or recognized by the relevant government shall provide inclusive education sports and recreational facilities for transgender persons without discrimination Now as far as health status of transgender persons is concerned we know that due to the professions they usually work in they are more susceptible to the communicable diseases such as hiv and due to the stigma associated with them and discrimination heaped upon them they do not usually approach the healthcare facilities which leads to the further worsening of their condition under the bill government shall take steps to provide health facilities to transgender persons including separate hiv surveillance centers and sex reassignment surgeries the government shall review medical curriculum to address health issues of transgender persons and provide comprehensive medical insurance schemes for them if the bill gets the approval of the president and becomes an act it will become an obligation of the government to run a separate medical insurance scheme for the transgender community now moving on to the next provisions we have certificate of identity for transgender persons now the bill creates a provision for assignment of certificate by district magistrate which will work as a certificate of identity indicating that the person is a transgender and care has been taken to make sure that if the same person goes through a surgery or sex reassignment surgery a revised certificate may also be obtained now this provision has created a lot of furor which we'll see in the next slide now the bill also makes it an obligation of the government to run welfare schemes for the transgender section it also makes it an obligation of the governments to ensure rescue and rehabilitation their vocational training so that they don't have to go back to their older profession if they don't like it and creation of self employment opportunities it was very important to create penalties for offenses against transgender persons and the bill 
has ensured that the following offenses against transgender persons shall be recognized and can be penalized now forced or bonded labor denial of use of public places removal from household physical sexual verbal emotional or economic abuse has become a crime if they are done against transgender persons imprisonment from 6 months to 2 years along with a fine has been provided for such an offence national council for transgender persons has been created now in the syllabus of gs2 there is a word known as statutory bodies since national council for transgender persons has been created via a statute it has become a statutory body now this shall consist of union minister for social justice minister of state for social justice secretary of the ministry of social justice one representative from ministries including health home affairs and hrd and there are other members as well an important aspect of the makeup of this council is that it shall mandatorily have five members from the transgender communities and five experts from ngos now this is a stakeholder approach under which it is ensured that the main stakeholder is included in the council now let's analyze the issues which have arisen due to the bill now the first issue is the meaning and implication of the term self perceived gender identity the bill states that a person will be recognized as transgender on the basis of a certificate of identity issued by district magistrate such a certificate will be proof of identity as transgender and confer rights are provided under the bill however the bill also states that a person who is recognized as transgender shall have the right to self perceived gender identity given that there is a requirement of a certificate of identity under the bill it is unclear what the term self perceived in itself means as far as gender identity is concerned the right of transgender persons to self perceived gender identity was perceived as a right by the supreme court judgment of 2014 in national legal services authority versus union of india 2014 case as well now moving on to the next issue which is the power of the district magistrate to issue certificate of identity now if a transgender person is denied a certificate of identity the bill does not provide a mechanism for appeal or review of such decision of district magistrate which means that there is no remedy if a person is denied a certificate of identity by the district magistrate and the second point is that the bill removes the provisions for a district screening committee and leaves the power to issue the certificate with the district magistrate solely and the procedures will be notified through rules which means that the procedure through which the district magistrate shall issue the certificate of identity has not been written down in the law and shall be framed later on in the form of rules which are liable to change and which are beyond the scrutiny of the parliament according to 2011 census there were around 5 lakh transgender persons in the country as we know that they are not only excluded from the society but they are discriminated against as well as the professions in which they are are extremely stigmatized and hence it's our duty to ensure their full participation in the community and the society to enable the society of india to grow inclusively let's now move on to the next news the next news has been published on page number 12 government plans to merge daman and diu with davdra and nagar haveli so these both union territories are going to be merged into a single union territory by the union government so in the first paragraph union minister of state for home g krishna reddy introduced a bill so you can learn from this line that the reorganization of the states and the relation between center and state is being taken care by ministry of home affairs so one of the tasks of ministry of home affairs is to maintain communication between state and center as well as to look into the reorganization of the union territories and states 
Now it is important to understand the constitutional provisions dealing with the reorganization of the states and union territories for two purposes. First, that first was the reorganization of Jammu Kashmir into union territory and then the merging of Daman and Diu with Dadra and Nagar Haveli. As far as the syllabus is concerned, this topic gets covered in prelim syllabus for Indian polity and governance, constitution, political system. As far as syllabus of mains general studies paper is concerned, it is extremely relevant for Indian constitution features as well as functions and responsibilities of union and states, issues and challenges pertaining to federal structure. As we know that reorganization leads to the changes in the federal structure and hence it becomes important for this line of the syllabus. Let's now look into the constitution of India. The constitution of India under part 1 deals with the union and its territories. So this union is not union territory rather it is the union of India which consists of states as well as union territories. So it's important to remember that part 1 deals with union and its territories. There are four articles under this part. First article deals with the name of the India and territory of the union. The second part deals with the admission or establishment of new states which means that the areas which are so far not under the territory of India can be either provided admission to or they a new state can be established. Now article 3 deals with formation of new states and alteration of areas, boundaries or names of existing states which we shall deal in detail and article 4 deals with laws made under articles 2 and 3 to provide for the amendment of first and fourth schedules and supplemental incidental and consequential matters. So first schedule maintains a list of states and union territories and fourth schedule allocates seats in council of states or Rajya Sabha to states and union territories. Obviously, if the areas and territories of the states and union territories are changed, there has to be a change in schedule 1 and schedule 4 and hence article 4 deals with that. Let's now analyze the provisions of the article 3. So the heading of the article 3 is formation of new states and alteration of areas, boundaries or names of existing states. Now before we deal with the provisions of the article, it's important to first look into the explanation 1 which is right here. It says that in this article, in clauses 1 to E, which means this portion, state includes a union territory. That means that whenever, wherever the word state has been used, it will imply both states as well as union territory. So the article 3 starts by saying parliament may by law, which means that for doing what has been written in 1 to E, parliament will have to enact a law. And what parliament can do after enactment of such a law? It can form a new state by separation of territory from any state or by uniting two or more states or parts of states or by uniting any territory to a part of any state. Parliament is also empowered to increase the area of any state, diminish the area of any state, alter the boundaries of any state and alter the name of any state but it can only do so through enactment of a law as stated in the first line. So after this, you, it should be clear to you that parliament through a law can not only increase or decrease the area of a state, it can also alter the boundaries of any state and as well as the name of the state. And it can do so by creation of new state by separation of territory from any state or by uniting two or more states or parts of states by uniting any territory to a part of any state. And keep that in mind that wherever state has been written, it can also mean union territory. So the news which deals with the merger of Dadra and Nagar Haveli with Daman and Diu, the provisions of this article shall be utilized. Now there is a paragraph which says 
provided that no bill for the purpose shall be introduced in either house of parliament except on the recommendation of president and unless where the proposal contained in the bill affects the area boundaries or name of any of the states the bill has been referred by the president to the legislature of that state for expressing its views thereon within such period as may be specified in the reference or within such further period as the president may allow and the period so specified or allowed or has expired in simple language what this means is that before tabling the bill in parliament bill shall be sent to the president and president shall recommend the bill to the parliament but even before recommending the bill to the parliament the president shall send the bill to the concerned state legislatures although in this particular case both these union territories do not have any legislature but if there was some state for example the creation of telangana the bill was first sent to the andhra pradesh assembly and only and the president shall also give a timeline under which that bill needs to be passed it is important to consider that it is not mandatory for the president or for the parliament to consider the views of the legislature so for example if the bill sent by the president to the concerned legislature is not passed by the legislature or declined by the legislature it will not have any effect on the passage of bill in the parliament it's a provision created to take into account the views of the states whose boundaries or territories are being affected also it is important to look into the second line of explanation which says that in the proviso state does not include a union territory so for the alteration of the areas or the boundaries or the names of union territories it is not mandatory for the president to send the bill to the concerned legislature even if it contains a legislature so for example government considers the reorganization of puducherry and we know that the union territory of puducherry contains a legislature but in that case it will not be mandatory for the president to send the bill to that pondicherry state legislature so as soon as the bill is recommended by the president it shall be considered by the parliament and if the parliament passes the bill then it becomes an act and after the passage of the act merger in this case shall be deemed to be done and the rest of the formality shall be conducted by ministry of home affairs now it is important to look into this particular article as to why the government is considering the merger of these two union territories now on the map you can see the location of daman and diu as well as dadra and nagar haveli now dadra and nagar haveli is a union territory in western india it is composed of two separate geographical entities one is nagar haveli which is wedged between maharashtra and gujarat and the smaller enclave of dadra which is surrounded by gujarat unlike the surrounding areas this dadra and nagar haveli territory was ruled by portuguese until mid 20th century a different kind of local culture had developed in this region which led to the creation of union territory of dadra and nagar haveli now as for daman and diu it is a union territory which comprises again of two distinct regions one is daman and another is diu that are geographically separated by gulf of khambat which is this region the state of gujarat and the arabian sea border the territory it was ruled by portuguese until 1961 and later it was annexed by india so these informations are extremely relevant for preliminary examination let's now look into the reasons why government of india wants to merge these two union territories now as we know that having two separate constitutional and administrative entities in both uts leads to a lot of duplication inefficiency and wasteful expenditure and also since the stated motto of the government of india is minimum government maximum governance and considering the small population and limited geographical area of both union territories and the use of the services of officers efficiently it has been decided to merge the union territories of dadra nagar haveli and daman and diu into single union territory
Next article is an editorial taken from page number 10. The Misadventure of New Citizenship Regime Now in past few days, people across the country have demanded conducting national register for citizen kind of exercise throughout the country. And now this article critically analyzes such a prospect. It highlights that such an exercise of counting citizens across the country does not justify either the means or its ends. This article contravenes the idea of nationwide NRC in a very point-wise manner. There is a reason that there is no particular syllabus portion has been mentioned in this particular article because it deals with a lot of topics which are extremely relevant for mains examination point of view. It can go into social issues, it can go into polity as well as into internal security. It can also form the part of GS4 syllabus as a lot of instances came into limelight when NRC was being conducted in Assam under which public dilemma or the crisis of conscience was aroused due to certain typical examples. Now we will analyze the main issues raised by the article. Now as far as demerits of nationwide NRC is concerned, the first and the foremost issue is of cost. Now when the NRC was conducted in Assam, it costed us around 1600 crore rupees. We can imagine that extending such an exercise across India will lead to many fold increase in the expenditure. Then for the conduct of NRC which was limited only to Assam, the human resource which were needed was around 50,000 officials. You can very well understand requirement of human resource if such an exercise is conducted across the country. It would not only result in an operational nightmare harassing both officials and people without achieving anything substantial, but according to the author's calculation, it will cost the exchequer somewhere around 4.3 lakh crore considering inflation for the next 10 years. Just like NRC in Assam, there will be a lot of documentation issues if it will be extended across the country. It will be extremely difficult for poor citizens who might not have old documents beyond a certain date. Thus, such an exercise could put undocumented citizens of India at risk of losing citizenship and place documented non-national migrants at ease. Now there is another issue which deals with uncertainty of cutoff date. So just like in case of NRC, 1971 was declared as cutoff date. There has to be a cutoff date declared nationwide for nationwide NRC. Depending upon what the cutoff date is chosen, it will create its own problems. So these are the four main demerits raised by the author as far as na nationwide NRC is concerned. Author also raises the issue of gradual shift of citizenship based on birth to blood-based citizenship. According to the author, idea of citizenship adopted by the present government is inconsistent with the idea of citizenship enumerated by the constitution makers. Now as you are aware that constitution does not declare the criteria for the award of citizenship. It empowers the parliament to enact a law. And hence parliament has enacted citizenship act 1955 which has been amended from time to time. Now acquisition of citizenship under the citizenship act 1955 can be done in five ways which is based on birth, descent, registration, naturalization and incorporation of territory. So as you can see that citizenship based on birth is one of the important aspects of India's citizenship paradigm which is this. However, a shift from this policy has been observed in last few decades. For example, in 2004, an exception to birth-based citizenship was created for individuals born in India but having one parent who was an illegal migrant at the time of their birth. And hence you can see it's a shift towards blood-based citizenship. So for example, a person born in India but her parents are illegal migrants in India that person would not be awarded citizenship and now extending this NRC to the whole of country will make all those people who were born and brought up in India non-citizens but at the same time government of India 
is bringing a law to amend the citizenship act 1955 which enables people belonging to hindu sikh buddhism jain parsi and christian religion will be awarded citizenship even if they are illegal migrants into the country so on one hand we are dividing people who are born in india of citizenship but on the other hand we are providing citizenship to the people who have illegally come to india based on religion so this is a contradiction so this article highlights the contradiction in changing paradigm of the criteria on which we award citizenship to the people residing in the country let's now move on to the next article moving on to the next news sharp eyed cartosat 3 to take to the skies today is published on page number 9 so isro is going to launch cartosat 3 in some time from satish dhawan space center shar at sri harikota in coastal andhra pradesh now as far as the specifications of cartosat as well as pslv is concerned we have recently covered this in detail in dns dated 19th of November 2019 the screenshot of which have been attached and if you want to listen to the details you can go to the dns dated 19th november 2019 this brings us to the end of the discussion today let's now analyze certain preliminary questions so the question will remain on the screen for 5 seconds and then we will start discussing the answers Now the first question reads consider the following statements Kolleru lake and Vembanad lake are both Ramsar sites this is correct there are no Ramsar sites in Bihar this is also correct and hence the right answer is C which is both 1 and 2 the next question is Sishu Kishor and Tarun categories of PMMY which is Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana loans have different collaterals this is incorrect as there is no provision of collateral in overall mudra scheme then the next option is Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana is run by Department of Expenditure under Ministry of Finance this option is also incorrect as we have seen in today's discussion that mudra yojana is run by department of financial services ministry of finance and hence the correct answer is d none of the above now the third question is which of the following institution releases world economic outlook report and world economic outlook report is released by imf so the correct answer is b with this we conclude the discussion for the day now let's take up the question of the day